When I mean old, I mean people that have been coming here, not in age. <laughs> so, let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, mighty King, we praise you, Lord, as the whole universe pauses this day to worship you. The only place that there are issues are here on planet Earth. You have a people that is supposed to set an example, Father. May your spirit be with us, Lord, that we do just that. That we learn daily, that we die daily to self. And allow the strength of your son to see us through. May we be a loud voice, Father, to uphold your will and to show the world that Jesus is king. We ask and pray, Father, for your guidance, for your spirit. Be with Bill and be with your people throughout this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're looking at Isaiah 58, but folks, it's a very serious chapter in the Bible. To Seventh-day Adventists, it's nothing to be taken lightly. And remember, well, those who have been following, this comes from Romans 11, talking about the Jews and how they would be included, provided they did what they were supposed to do. It wouldn't be just, oh, okay, just because you're a Jew, you can, uh, you're going to go to heaven. No. Just because you're Seventh-day Adventist, you're going to go to heaven. No. There are conditions. The free gift is very costly. I'm going to be looking, and, and, and we're going to be talking about the repairers of the breach. We're going to be talking about reinstating the Sabbath. That's Isaiah 58. We've already looked at the first part, but I'm going to take a minute here, actually about 10 minutes. In this book, Early Writings, every Seventh-day Adventist should know this book. This is the first great controversy. This is strictly for Seventh-day Adventists. The things that are in this book, the funny thing is, many Seventh-day Adventists don't like. They won't read it because it's sharp and it hurts. What we're going to be looking at, and for instance, let me run down some of the chapters in this book, and it's actually two books combined into this one book. For instance, <laughs> The Trial of Our Faith, The Little Flock, The Last Plagues and Judgment, End of the 2300 Days, Duty in view of the time of trouble. Do you think that's stuff we need to know about? The messengers, that's people who are supposed to be preaching the three angels' messages. Mark of the beast, the blind leading the blind. Preparation for the end, etc. These are things we need to know. Now I want to read out a page before we continue in Isaiah 58 and start talking about present truth, because Seventh-day Adventists don't even know what that is anymore. And I've said this a lot of times. You get ten of them in a room, and you ask each one of them what present truth is, you're going to get ten answers. And I'll bet you most of them will be wrong. Well, there's no guessing at what present truth is, because in this little book, and in many writings that Mrs. White has written, present truth is spelled out. Now, the health message comes under the third angel's message, period. It is not its own message. Never was, never was intended to be. Many people stumble and trip over that. Of course, in this book, it talks about the messengers who do twist these things up and do get people confused. She says here, page 63, and the messengers... I saw the necessity of the messengers especially watching and checking all fanaticism wherever they might see it rise. 
Satan is pressing in on every side, and unless we watch for him and have our eyes open to his devices and snares and have on the whole armor of God, the fiery darts of the wicked one will hit us. Did you hear the clothing we're supposed to be wearing? Don't worry about fashion. Don't worry about peer pressure and all that. Worry about whether you got the armor of God on. And I got news for you. If your armor's not all dented and beat up, you're not using it. That's what armor does. That's what armor does. It stops incoming rounds. I spent 10 years in the army in, in armor. <laughs> but this armor's impenetrable. Um, but you have to maintain it every day. If you do not die daily, if I do not die daily, guess what? That armor's useless. And there's an interesting story in the Bible about armor, isn't there? Isn't there? That a young man, 14 years old, name of David, defeated one of the most powerful warriors of his day. But you see, there was an issue about armor in that story, wasn't there? Who wanted David to wear his armor? And whose armor did David ultimately wear, you see? See, everything in the Bible has two meanings. There's a spiritual and a physical. Saul's armor was physical, was it not? Why did Saul offer David his armor? He was the head of the general conference. If David de somehow defeated Goliath, who would have got the credit? Oh, it was my armor. See, the Holy Spirit was there with you in my armor. Is that a far stretch to imagine, given Saul's character? But David said, I can't wear these things. They will keep me back. You want to be loyal to a man, you will die in this battle. How many rocks did David pick up, by the way? One? Five. Why five? Very specific number. How many brothers did Goliath have? Four. Who was he prepared to do battle with? And every one was as big as the other. If you read through Chronicles, you'll find out who killed the other brothers. Jonathan killed one. So David was prepared at 14 years old to go out and do battle with whom? Five. David knew he wasn't going to get a second shot at this guy. Really? See, so he put on the proper armor and he got a great victory. But it was spiritual armor that Goliath couldn't see. Saul couldn't see it. The devil saw it. The devil was hoping he was going to use Saul's weaponry. Folks, you want to use man's weaponry to win the great controversy, you're not going to make it. There are many precious truths contained in the word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. But such subjects, now here is present truth. But such subjects as the sanctuary, in connection with the 2300 days, that's this, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and show what our present position is. Established the faith of doubting and given uh, 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 certainty to the glorious future. These I have frequently seen where the principal subjects of which the messengers should dwell. What is our job? She says now is the time. What is it? What did Paul say after Mars Hill? Paul said it too. What did he say? What did he say? No more of this theology garbage. No more of men's wisdom. I will only preach what? Christ and him crucified. 
What is that? Present truth. Now, that's one source of finding present what, she, what is described as present truth. Page 63 of early writings. Now, I want to go to Revelation. Well, what does all this have to do with Isaiah 58? Well, remember, we're talking about the repairers of the breach. 12. And I want to read about God's people. Revelation 12.10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Now, you'll notice how John worded, Who? Is Jesus working for? Who? Listen to what he says. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of Christ. Is that what it says? His Christ. Who is his Christ? See, we put a wedge between... Jesus and the Father, because you see, Jesus is love. And we can do whatever we want, and he's going to forgive us. And the Seventh-day Adventists have been preaching for decades, you can't be perfect, you'll never be perfect and go to heaven. Because Jesus is love, and he'll make up for it. God says, you must be. So you see, there's a wedge put between, they make an idol out of Christ, and a heavy taskmaster out of his father. See how that works? But here we see clearly John words it through the Holy Spirit that Jesus is working for God and for us. Does God need salvation? So who's salvation? Us. But he's his Christ. Who's Christ? The Father's Christ. He could not have done this without the Father's permission. For what purpose? Well, it all boils down to one thing on the high priest's costume. Do you know what it is? You see this little plate right here? Right there. That little plate. It all boils down to that band of gold that goes across the helmet of righteousness, by the way. What does that say? In Hebrew, it would be Kadesh La Yehovah or Kadesh la Yehovah, it simply means holiness to the Lord. You know what that transfers? The Ark of the Covenant is now put here. You see? Between, in your, there's a reason why this is called the temple, folks. Did you ever think about that? The Holy Spirit animates us as it relates to holiness to the Lord in a decision that we make to have the Ten Commandments taken out of the stone that are in that Ark of the Covenant and put in the flesh. I die daily. Let us make man after our own image. That's what it all boils down to, and that's why that sits there. That's the helmet of righteousness. Holiness to the Lord. What does that mean? All my decisions will be animated by the Holy Spirit. That's what that means. That's what it means. Simple. The whole costume that he wears, everything, that the high priest, everything in the sanctuary comes down to this one item. Because everything beneath it is to purify us so we are holiness to the Lord. It's that simple. But Seventh-day Adventists don't know that. See, they holiness to whoever's in front, holiness to the conference, holiness to Ted Wilson, Doug Batchelor, who have taken money from the government to close their institutions, millions and millions of dollars. And 3ABN, why can't you study for yourself? Why can't you connect with the Holy Spirit and be used as a vessel? Why can't we take our young people and point them in that direction? Not worry about their position in the world, because that's going to burn up soon. Yes, you will be ridiculed and mocked, big time. 
We've had death threats here. We've had people telling us that they hope all of us get coronavirus and very sick because we're open on Sabbath, Seventh-day Adventists. Isn't that nice? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Says here in verse 11, and folks, I got to tell you something. This pertains to me. I don't know about you. I don't know where you are in your life with Christ, but I got a lot to clean up. Because I can't say the prince of this world comes and he's got nothing in me. See, that's the problem. Now listen, verse 11. And they, being the saints, of course, we all know these verses, overcame him, who's him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. What did they give up, the saints? Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw this, he was cast to the earth. He persecuted the woman who brought forth the man-child. So there's going to be a war going on. Whose armor are you going to wear? Whose armor do you want to wear, folks? Who are you going to trust? And it also says in here, and we're not going to read it, you all know, that they followed the lamb wheresoever he went. Right? The saints? Did Jesus run away from the battle or did he run into it? Which one? Did Jesus sit at home on Sabbath and play with his computer? Or did he go out and get in a fight with the Pharisees? Which one? And the reason he got in a blow, oh, you can't say that. Yeah, that's what he did. He picked his fights as led by the Holy Spirit to glorify what? Why did Jesus get into conflict with the Pharisees on the Sabbath? What was the purpose of that? because they claimed to have the keys to the Sabbath. They accused the Creator of doing what? He who instituted the Sabbath of breaking the Sabbath because he did not bow to them. What man are you going to bow to? Which man are you going to allow to steal your crown of glory? What crazy deal are we going to make with Lucifer to be cast into the lake of fire with him. I ask you. I ask you. It says here, but he had but a short time. The devil knew that. <laughs> you know, the only place that a watch rules your, anybody's life is on planet Earth. You know that, right? What do you do with a watch when you are living forever? What good is a watch? The only place coffins are made is here. The only place there's hospitals, clinics, police, firemen, EMS workers is here. The only place there's thieves, crooks, murderers, adulterers is here. And you know what's sad? A lot of them are into churches because they're stealing people's eternity. They're the worst kind of murderers. What did Jesus call the leaders of the first century Seventh-day Adventist church? What did he call them? Liars and murderers. That's a hard thing, isn't it? I want now to spend some more time with early writings here because I want you to hear something. And I think it's dire important, well dire, I think it's, it's very important to understanding Isaiah 58, at least this portion of this book. And it's called The Mark of the Beast. This is eight hours and, oh, eight hours. <laughs> eight minutes and 30 seconds. And after this, we're going to continue on. 
Remember, folks, we have to follow the lamb wheresoever he goes. And you know, it's interesting that John recorded it that way. Why didn't he say the king? Why didn't he say the Lord of Sabaoth? Why? Well, the Lord of Sabaoth is, is a commanding general of an army. But what is a lamb? In other words, in that statement, follow the lamb wheresoever he goes. Where did the lamb end up? Where did he end up? And they loved not their lives unto death. Jesus said, those who lose their lives will what? Gain it. Those who seek to gain their lives will what? You want to go out in the world and make your way? Go right ahead. The Pharisees did. Jesus said, the harlots and the prostitutes will enter heaven before you. Boy, that really... And what he meant by that wasn't that they were going to heaven. In that vernacular, in that interpretation, you're not going to heaven. That's what that meant. But they're so holy and righteous. Don't look at any man. When I say man, I mean mankind. The real meaning of the word, which means women and children. And think that you have to emulate them. You look to Jesus. No man has paid this price. And when we have to follow the lamb wherever he goes, that means when people treat us like garbage, race, creed, we have to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Consider this man hanging on this cross. What was he concerned about? He's being mocked beyond any insult that any of us will ever endure. I'm offended. Really? He's bloodied. His beard has been pulled out. Folks, when it is recorded that the Roman soldiers had compassion because of the way he was being treated, Roman soldiers were fierce. And these guys, these centurions and the guys that were on that detail, they were the older guys. They were the combat-hardened troops that did incredible violence. Think about that. Remember what it said? They wanted to hack down the people that were treating Christ so badly? Has anybody ever been treated that way in here? No. No. But we get offended. The devil loves that. So we have to follow the lamb wherever he goes, and that's where we got to go, and we have to be like lambs led to the slaughter. Who wants to do that? Can I see a show of hands? I don't. But I have to learn to be content no matter what situation I find myself in. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, what was he concerned about? He said to John, his mother was there, what did he do? Made living arrangements for his mother, did he not? who didn't even know what was going on. But he was concerned about his mother's future. While he was beaten, not fed, hadn't give, been given anything to drink for, for, for many hours, what's he concerned about? Is that our reaction to people who treat us badly? Or do we want to do what they do to us? See, we remember that part of the Bible, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But you see, a good part of that is discipline has gone out the window. Eh, I'm not even going to get over on that. But anyhow, let's listen to this. This is Mark of the Beast, Early Writings, chapter 14. By chapter way, 14, Mark of the Beast. In a view given June 27, 1850, my accompanying angel said, Time is almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? Then I was pointed to the earth and saw that there would have to be a getting ready among those who have of late embraced the third angel's message. Said the angel, Get ready, get ready, get ready ye will have to die a greater death to the world than ye have ever yet died. I saw that there was a great work to do for them, and 
and but little time in which to do it. Then I saw that the seven last plagues were soon to be poured out upon those who have no shelter, yet the world regarded them no more than they would so many drops of water that were about to fall. I was then made capable of enduring the awful sight of the seven last plagues, the wrath of God. I saw that his anger was dreadful and terrible, and if he should stretch forth his hand or lift it in anger, the inhabitants of the world would be as though they had never been, or would suffer from incurable sores and withering plagues that would come upon them, and they would find no deliverance but be destroyed by them. Terror seized me, and I fell upon my face before the angel and begged of him to cause the sight to be removed, to hide it from me, for it was too dreadful. Then I realized, as never before, the importance of searching the word of God carefully, to know how to escape the plagues which that word declares shall come on all the ungodly who shall worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in their foreheads or in their hands. You think it's important for us to be about that business? Do you think that that shouldn't be a Seventh-day Adventist priority to get as many people aware and away from these plagues as possible? And yes, each individual can do that. You don't need to go to school. Jesus didn't. John the Baptist didn't. You need to be in the school of Christ, and the Holy Spirit can lead you. All of God's workers in the Bible worked up until the day they died, regardless of age. So this idea, I'm too old, or I'm too young, uh-uh. What should be put in there is I'm too selfish. But you see, we don't talk like that. That's offensive. Well, I'm not politically correct. Neither is God. So don't you think that Seventh-day Adventists should be focused on this and not on foolishness? Let's continue. It was a great wonder to me that any could transgress the law of God and tread down his holy Sabbath when such awful threatenings and denunciations were against them. The Pope has changed the day of rest from the seventh to the first day. He has thought to change the very commandment that was given to cause man to remember his creator. He has thought to change the greatest commandment in the Decalogue and thus make himself equal with God or even exalt himself above God. The Lord is unchangeable, therefore his law is immutable. But the Pope has exalted himself above God in seeking to change his immutable precepts of holiness justice and goodness. He has trampled underfoot God's sanctified day and on his own authority put in its place one of the six laboring days. The whole nation has followed after the beast and every week they rob God of his holy time. The Pope has made a breach in the holy law of God but I saw that the time had fully come for this breach to be made up by the people of God and the waste places built up. I pleaded before the angel. That's Isaiah 58. So what do we do? We close our churches. Whose idea do you think that was in light of what the prophet is telling us? God's or the Pope's? Should we be conforming to that? Or should we be, and, I, and I'm going to say something here. I think it's foolhardily or f foolish to go out in public and do evangelism and not wear a mask. And I'm going to tell you why. As wise as serpents and as harmless as doves, don't give them the opportunity to say, oh, oh, yeah, you're, you're a wacko. No. What will that cost you? But what might it cost that person? Think about it. You want to go through parking lot and put, and that's all he asks us to do, put some books, some brochures on, on, on vehicles dealing with the third angel's message, wear your mask or whatever. Take it off when you get in your car, whatever, I don't care. But why bring that reproach down on yourself? And more importantly, on God's work. Over a silly thing like that, but close your church? Really, a Seventh-day Adventist? Okay.
when there's so much at stake. To save his people who had gone astray, to save them for his mercy's sake. When the plagues begin to fall, those who continue to break the Holy Sabbath will not open their mouths to plead those excuses that they now make to get rid of keeping it. Their mouths will be closed while the plagues are falling, and the great lawgiver is requiring justice of those who have had his holy law in derision and have called it a curse to man, miserable and rickety. When such feel the iron grasp of this law taking hold of them, these expressions will appear before them in living characters, and they will then realize the sin of having that law in derision, which the word of God calls holy, just, and good. Then I was pointed to the glory of heaven, to the treasure laid up for the faithful. Everything was lovely and glorious. The angels would sing a lovely song, then they would cease singing and take their crowns from their heads and cast them glittering at the feet of the lovely Jesus and with melodious voices cry, Glory, Alleluia! I joined with them in their songs of praise and honor to the Lamb, and every time I opened my mouth to praise Him, I felt an unutterable sense of the glory that surrounded me. It was a far more an exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Said the angel, The little remnant who love God and keep his commandments and are faithful to the end will enjoy this glory and ever be in the presence of Jesus and sing with the holy angels. Then my eyes were taken from the glory and I was pointed to the remnant on the earth. The angel said to them, Will ye shun the seven last plagues? Will ye go to glory and enjoy all that God has prepared for those that love him and are willing to suffer for his sake? If so, ye must die that ye may live. Amen. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Ye must have a greater preparation than ye now have, for the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate and to destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Sacrifice all to God. Lay all upon his altar, self, property, and all a living sacrifice. It will take all to enter glory. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where no thief can approach or rust corrupt. Ye must be partakers of Christ's sufferings here, if ye would be partakers with him of his glory hereafter. Heaven will be cheap enough if we obtain it through suffering. We must deny self all along the way, die to self daily, let Jesus alone appear and keep his glory continually in view. I saw that those who of late have embraced the truth would have to know what it is to suffer for Christ's sake, that they would have trials to pass through that would be keen and cutting in order that they may be purified and fitted through suffering to receive the seal of the living God, pass through the time of trouble, see the king in his beauty, and dwell in the presence of God and of pure holy angels. As I saw what we must be in order to inherit glory, and then saw how much Jesus had suffered to obtain for us so rich an inheritance, I prayed that we might be baptized into Christ's sufferings, that we might not shrink at trials, but bear them with patience and joy, knowing what Jesus had suffered, that we through his poverty and sufferings might be made rich. Said the angel, Deny self, ye must step fast. Some of us have had time to get the truth and to advance step by step, and every step we have taken has given us strength to take the next. But now time is almost finished, and what we have been years learning, they will have to learn in a few months. They will also have much to unlearn and much to learn again. Those who would not receive the mark of the beast in his image when the decree goes forth, must have decision now to say nay. 
we will not regard the institution of the beast. Simple little chapter. Now, let me ask you a question. Say, no, we won't regard the institution of the beast. So, by closing your churches now, is this a forerunner to these laws and commands, do you think? Is this a test run for Rome to see who is going to go? Folks, when these churches open up, they are not going to be anywhere near what they were as far as their religious order goes. They will be Romanized. I see Ted Wilson is asking for prayer for the St. Helena Institute out there in Northern California and those areas where they're burning. But you know what? These places have wine parties. They host the local wine growers because they contribute a lot of money there. So they have these parties where they serve all kinds of food and they drink alcohol and it's all one happy family. That's sad. This is a Seventh-day Adventist healing institution. No, this is, and I'm not judging them, folks, because the Lord, I mean, they've got to make some decisions here with what's going on out there. But it's coming to all of us. And I don't know that there's anything more pressing in our lives right now, every man, woman, and child on this earth, than what's going to happen in the very near future. So as Seventh-day Adventists, what should we be doing? Not on a corporate level, on a personal level. What should we be doing? We go back to Isaiah 58. And I'm going to read. I read this last week, verse 12 of Isaiah 58. And they shall be of thee, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, and they shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and they shall be called the repairers of the breach, the false day of rest for the Sabbath, the fourth commandment. That's not in here. That's just a note I put in here. The restorers of the path to dwell in. If thou turn thy foot away from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy Sabbath, uh, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, not finding thine own pleasure, not speaking thine own words, then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob, thy father, and the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, it's interesting some things that are said here that Isaiah put down. What is he talking about? And of course, he's talking to Seventh-day Adventists, by the way, because who can be the repair? Who built the wall around Jerusalem? Who did it? After the Nehemiah and those gentlemen worked. Who was it? It was Seventh-day Adventists. What did that wall represent? What was it? The hedge of the Ten Commandments around God's people. See, but there was an issue. Well, not an issue. The gates, the main gate of the city was not completed when the wall was. And what was going on? What did Nehemiah say? What was going on? Remember the story? On the Sabbath, what was happening? Peddlers and merchants were coming into the city and doing business with the Seventh-day Adventists. Well, you know, it's interesting because in the book of Revelation, we're told that Rome would make merchandise of the souls of men. So now we see our denomination on the Sabbath is doing business with the world. And what did Nehemiah say? He got the gates, put them up, and then they would come and stand outside the gates. What did he tell them? If you don't leave, I will come down there and lay hands on you. What did he mean by that? Now, mind you, these were Samaritans. Did you know that? That's why there was a riff. 
between the Jew and the Samaritan when they were all Jews. They were all Israelites. But they wanted to help rebuild the wall. Sambias and Tabala want to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And Nehemiah said, oh no. It can only be the faithful. It can only be the faithful. Who are the faithful that we're talking? I don't, you don't have to guess at it because the Holy Spirit has supplied that answer. Who are the faithful? Who was Nehemiah uh, working with? If you go to Revelation 14, it tells us who they are. It says here, Revelation 14, 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and the voice of the great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the four elders. And no man could learn the song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they. Now, mind you, we know who the 144,000 are, but they all have to have, we all have to have that character. See those 12 stones on there? There's your character. If you don't have that character that those 12 stones represent, you know, that's how you get through the gates of the New Jerusalem. Every one of those stones represents a character trait. That's why they're there. And there's only 12 character traits known to man. Did you know that? Ask a psychiatrist. And we have to have every one of those character traits. By the way, where is it located? This is the beautiful thing. Where is this located? Something we have to do ourselves? Who's carrying this? Who's the high priest now? Jesus. This is a representation of the high priest, not Jesus. We have no idols here. But on here, too, we see on his shoulders, there's two stones of onyx. What's written on these stones? What's here? Six tribes, six tribes, the same thing that's here. Who's carrying us? Who's the high priest? Who's the lamb? See that red stripe? The blood. That's what that represents. And then you have the blue, the purple, the golden character. These two combined make red. Christ's character, Christ's integrity. Christ, what did they put on Jesus? What kind of a robe did they put on Jesus at his crucifixion? What color was it? That's this, purple. Character, integrity. You see, royalty. Isn't that what purple stands for? Well, when you mix that and that, you get red. That's why they're there. And you have a gold in between. That's the commandments of God, the character of God. And through these two stripes, and this and this, we'll make it. But we have to allow him to carry us through his Holy Spirit. No conference can do that. No independent ministry can do that. No man can do that. Your relationship right here to God. It's all there. It's all there. You want to know about the sanctuary? Understand the high priest's robes, because it's all here. Here's the wedding garment, the white robe of righteousness that must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. What does that mean? You can't wash something in blood and have it clean. That means simple to allow him to carry us. That's all it means. The sacrifice is accepted. Follow the lamb wheresoever he goes. Now, we were asked another question. I asked another question. Who were these people? Well, it says here, and understand, and we got off on that, because this just doesn't apply to the 144,000. In order to get through the gates of that city, you have to have this, these character traits. And by the way, each one of these is a tribe of Israel, and this is spiritual Israel. Because remember, in Revelation, two of the tribes were changed. Okay? And the most predominant character trait, character trait you will have will be the gate of the new Jerusalem you're going to go through because there's 12 gates. Isn't that amazing? And whatever your predominant character trait is, that's the one you're going to go through. But you will have to have all of these. Are they something we can accomplish ourselves, or are they washing our robes in the blood of the Lamb and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us through 
holiness to the Lord. Die daily. Put your armor on. So it says here that uh, these are they, uh, verse 4, which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. You know how much garbage I heard about that. You poor women, you heard about it too, I'm sure, if you were in Adventism for any amount of time. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes. Oh, there it is. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and the Lamb. By the way, it's right there, the answer to that question, who are these people? They were not defiled with women, they were virgins. What does that mean? What does a church signify that in the Bible? What is a church? It's a woman. What is the church as in relationship to the wedding garment? The bride of Christ. So what would it mean spiritually that they were virgins and not defiled by women? What is Rome seen as in the Bible? An adulteress, a prostitute. Correct? So these are men, women, and children who are what? 100% faithful to Christ. Or in other words, repairers of the breach. Or in other words, fully versed in present truth and ready to go out and spread it. See it all fits together? It says, not to do your pleasure on the Sabbath. That doesn't mean going shopping, going to a rest. Oh, no. We have so many pleasures on the Sabbath. People come to church. They do this. They do that. They go home. They go to sleep because they have to rest for the rest of the day because they've had such a hard week. They do everything but what Jesus did. What did he do on the Sabbath? What did he do? Did he go home and go to sleep? Did he go back, sit in the church, and have Bible study? Is that what he did? He got in a lot of trouble on the Sabbath. He even got every Sabbath. He was accused of breaking the Sabbath by the Pharisees. Why? He said after he healed people, what? If you had an animal that was lying in a trench on the Sabbath, you'd go down and pull it out of there. Why? Because it's a monetary issue. But yet a human being is not more important than that animal. So Jesus was out doing good not according to what Jesus considered to be good, but what his father... Did you not know I would be about my father's business at 12 years old? You see, he was wearing his helmet of righteousness when he made that statement. So what should we be doing on the Sabbath? Oh, yes, Paul, but Mrs. White said that we should rest. Yes, after we do our father's business. Who here goes to work and then rests at work? Well, that's a loaded question anymore. But who here goes to work and then goes to sleep? Or does what they want to do at work? Who? Who? Nobody. Why? What would happen to your job? Is God any different? Sabbath is his day that we are separated from the world and totally committed to what? What Jesus did on the Sabbath. And it's my contention, well, not contention, I think it's a fact, that if we treat the Sabbath the way Jesus did, we will become virgins. Did Jesus tell a parable about virgins? Ten of them, right? Five and five, right? How many commandments are there? Where's the division in the commandments? What's the halfway point? The fourth. Not numerically, folks. Spiritually, we know the other nine hang on the fourth. So you have a division in the church, don't you, in that parable? Five and five. What's the issue? Worship, the Holy Spirit being lacking. They were all sincere, weren't they? But they were also all asleep. I just played you from our prophet, we need to get awake. And when they say, when you hear in that vernacular, get ready, get that repeated three times, you know what that means? They didn't have a memory loss. It means it's urgent. It's just like in the King James when it says, verily I say unto you, that is, pay attention. It's urgent. 
So what? Do thy pleasure on the Sabbath? And I, yes, you have children. They need to be ministered to. They need to be taught that the Sabbath is not a day of drudgery. That's when I came up. You know, one of the main reasons I left the church when I was a teenager was because they were sitting there on the Sabbath arguing about eating nectarines because it was a, 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 an amalgamated fruit and whether you should eat tuna fish or not because it had skin over its scales. I said, these people are nuts. I am telling you, that's a fact. You go back to the early 70s, and you will find this was a big issue. In the, you couldn't mix like a sangria. Oh, you can't drink. There was a group here and a group here on that. You're mixing everything. Well, that's not what the spirit of prophecy says, first of all. And second of all, why are you eating meat anyway? Because Mrs. White says those who are preparing for translation should cease the use of flesh food. They will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why I left the church, because I thought they were nuts. You're sitting there arguing over, and we have the same thing. Messengers, messengers, you have the same thing going on today. It's stupid. How about, folks, we be about our father's business? How about we train up the young people to, and let them make their own decisions? They're going to have to make mistakes. They're going to have to fall on their face. Who here didn't? But we have to put the truth in there, and we have to show them you will be different, you will have trial and tribulation, you will be mocked, but it's okay, because you, who's your father? Who's your father? Does it matter? Did Jesus take offense ever? After the apostles, the disciples became the apostles, did they take offense, or did they understand? These poor people don't know what they're doing. They haven't a clue. It's like a little child. When a little child does something stupid, do you beat the child? Do you say, they got to learn? Or do you have sympathy for them? When they hurt themselves, they don't know what they're doing. So, folks, as we study Isaiah 58, and I see Adventists on the Sabbath go from meeting to meeting to meeting, and then they're tired and they go home and go to sleep. And what do the kids do? Leave the church, because they're not involved. And then we wonder why. It's sad. There's a lot to do on the Sabbath. And yes, we are supposed to rest at one point. Absolutely. We are supposed to enjoy nature at one point. But when do you do that during the week? After work. Rest from your secular activities and be totally devoted to God on that. And also, like believers, it's very important. To re that you can let your guard down. Recharge your batteries. So as Seventh-day Adventists, given the times that we're in, given the decrees that our government has given us that came right from Rome, because Anthony Fauci, you know, was a Jesuit, right? You know that, right? Jesuit trained. Went to Jesuit universities. Number one pupil. And I don't know how many of you remember Anthony Fauci in the late 80s and early 90s. Do you remember him? There was a, a, a movement in America called ACT UP. It was with the homosexual movement. He was Mr. Condom Man. They were going to cure AIDS with condoms. He's the one that suggested start handing them out in schools to, to, to young kids. I was Anthony Fauci. And where have we gone since then? Up or down? Amazing, folks. California is legendary trying to pass a law that 14-year-olds uh, are fair game. Isn't that nice? And if you've had relations with a minor, it should never go on your record, shouldn't be a sex crime. Isn't that nice? Isn't that wonderful? Folks, if you don't think we're in the final movements and we're told that they will be rapid ones, I strongly recommend you read early writings. And young people, you got a lot of decisions to make. Get rid of that peer pressure garbage. See, I didn't have to come up with that. It was different. They were starting to bring that in when I was a kid. But everybody was still pretty much an individual. You had some. That was all and everything to look like it's always been. But 
You want to argue over tuna fish and nectar range, you go right ahead. But we have bigger issues. We have to be repairers of the breach. We have to keep the Sabbath as Jesus did. And folks, you will be persecuted. Jesus said, if they have hated me, they will hate you. But peace I leave unto you. We talked about that last week. And in eternity, what is 70, 80 years? It doesn't even appear. We think we have such a hard life. We have to learn to follow the lamb wheresoever he goes. And that's where he went. For himself or somebody else. We have to have the same attitude. And we can't do that alone. We have to have the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. I have go to prepare a place for you. Promises like no, nothing else. But we're going to have to suffer here. We're going to have to prove our mettle, as they say. The British. That's armor, by the way, to see how tough it is. We're going to have to do that because we're condemned criminals. And we have to make the decision to be carried on our, our Savior's soldiers, shoulders, born on his chest next to his heart, and wear the helmet of righteousness. We have to make, and then he will honor that. And he doesn't say it's going to be easy, does he? But the reward we can't even imagine. Let's pray. Mighty King, what a privilege, Father, that we sinful, rebellious individuals, lawbreakers, can come before your throne through the blood of your Son. Lord, may each one of us have our wedding garment on, which is the armor. May each one of us follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes. May each one of us be able to say the prince of this world comes and he has nothing in me. It's a tall order, but Father, you've put everything, everything we need in place to overcome and to be victorious and to rally under the blood-stained banner of your son. May we each choose to do this. And Father, these young people, be with them. Be with them. The devil has taken all his knowledge and wisdom, and he's aimed it at these generations. But let them wear the helmet of righteousness, each one of us, that his darts cannot penetrate. Help us, Father, to trade in our armor for a crown of glory. We ask and pray you be with us, be with each and every one of your faithful people, that we may be true and we may partake on the sea of glass. In Jesus' name we ask and pray these things. Amen.